Good morning, everybody. In the, in the excellent IGF tradition, we are going to start this open forum on time. It's exactly nine o'clock in the morning. This is actually not the right time. Um, uh, and uh, I'm very pleased to uh, moderate this uh, open forum this morning on uh, private sector hack back with the question, where are the limits? Um, I am Laurent Bernard. I work for the OECD Secretariat in Paris. Um, and I will just say a few words about this open forum and the, the context for it, and then we'll go uh, with our panelists. Um, this uh, open forum was proposed by the OECD for this uh, IGF meeting um, as a kind of um, um, a first step towards a meeting that will take place in Paris uh, on 13, 14 December 2018, and it will be a meeting of the newly launched OECD Global Forum on Digital Security for Prosperity. It's an OECD initiative to uh, bring together a community, an international community of experts addressing digital security for prosperity. That is digital security from the perspective of economic and social prosperity rather than perspective of international security or a pure technical perspective or the perspective of cybercrime. Um, and this uh, first meeting in December of the Global Forum will address uh, uh, the roles and responsibilities of actors for digital security, in particular uh, uh, the roles and responsibilities of private sector actors. And in this event in December, we will have a session on active defense, hack back by the private sector, what are the challenges they raise, um, what are the issues they raise at international level, how should we address it. And we, we thought this it would be a great opportunity at uh, the IGF this year, which takes place in Paris, um, to, uh, to start to have a discussion on these issues. Um, so let me just uh, say a couple of words on the scope of this discussion. Uh, when we talk about hack back in, in the context of this session, I don't know elsewhere, but in the context of this session, of this discussion, we are talking about private sector actors, so businesses basically, who uh, face digital security attacks and who may have in response or in the course of these attacks, uh, who may take uh, measures to address these attacks that are of an active nature, we can we'll discuss what that may mean or may not mean, um, may take actions that may have an active uh, uh, nature uh, or um, that can be considered as hacking back. Um, these, uh, these type of measures raise a number of uh, uh, concerns, uh, challenges, but they can also be seen as uh, something positive that should actually be uh, uh, encouraged. Um, we should have a discussion on this. Um, so to have this uh, conversation, I am very uh, pleased to have uh, five uh, distinguished panelists that I will very briefly introduce and then I will give them a five minute uh, time slot to um, give their perspective on this issue. Uh, we'll have uh, uh, questions from the audience after each of them and then we'll go into a discussion with you and the panelists. Uh, until 10 o'clock, which is the end of our panel. Um, so I will immediately turn to uh, um, Alp Tucker, uh, who is director and founder of the NetBlocks Global Internet Observatory. He is a contributor to internet protocols at the Internet Engineering Task Force and a Sakharov Fellow of the European Parliament. He will speak from, uh, I guess, the civil society and technical side perspective of this issue. Uh, Alp, what is your perspective on this issue? Thank you, Laurent. So, um, well, two weeks ago I was in Taiwan and I was talking with uh, the congressman, uh, Jason Zhu, and he gave me a shocking statistic about uh, the situation of cybersecurity in his country. He told me that uh, there are on average 30,000 cyber attacks daily. Uh, coming from the mainland alone. And this, in context, uh, you look at this, you look at the statistics, and you see that this isn't so much uh, 
nation state sponsored attacking. It is a mix of many stakeholders, many different vectors for attack. Um, looking through the figures, and these are more wide general figures, you see that uh, some 17% of attacks can be attributed to nation states, with uh, the rest being attributed to either the private sector or lone wolves or different, uh, different uh, stakeholders. So in that context, today's session is, is extremely valuable because it's the less discussed side of the problem, and in fact, it's the majority of the incidents that we see. So uh, from a technical sp perspective, and that's really what I'm trying to add here, is, is to look at uh, what is the nature of hacking back, what does it mean? Um, then we have these terms that Laurent discussed, like uh, an active or a passive um, uh, security measures. And some of this terminology is quite outdated. We find that uh, the whole field of, of cyber security and, uh, you know, or, or information security, depending on uh, perhaps the dictionary, the lexicon that you use, uh, varies a lot. So it's, it's worth doing a refresher and seeing how this, uh, what this means in the current uh, lexicon. So um, what I see as a technologist is that the Internet is, is a global network that is actually built on trust. So today we're here um, discussing the Internet of Trust. And in fact, um, digital networks, computer networks are built on the idea that you trust your peer, that when you send an internet packet, you're asking for that to be relayed to the next hop. So you're not sending some, something so much as you're asking for that information to be shared. And in that respect, uh, I think we see a lot of problems with this idea of hacking back. Uh, you have questions about what does it mean? Who is meant to carry this traffic on the most fundamental level? We're talking about the transport of information um, nobody actually has to carry that data, including the next hop, the next peer. So if you look at protocols like BGP, IP, TCP, they're all built on the goodwill of uh, the network uh, users. And in the case of hacking back, the big question is, does that goodwill still exist if you are then trying to exploit somebody who has perhaps exploited you? Or put more simply, um, you know, is it okay to rob somebody's house if they've robbed your house? And as a victim of crime, you might think that's a reasonable thing to do. But yet, um, it's probably not the legal thing to do or the ethical thing to do. Um, so three types of hacking back that we cat categorize. There are some, sometimes four, but this is the one we use at NetBlocks. So we have the exploratory or validation, uh, which is an active measure, but it's very mild, very modest, because we're talking about simply trying to go through data and perhaps passively access remote services. This might mean entering a URL in your bar, perhaps a hidden URL, which you're not meant to know, so that you can get attribution to an attack. So this kind of um, exploratory hackback seems to be the kind that is perhaps the least uh, problematic from a legal perspective. And I'm sure we'll have a look at that in a bit. And then you have the preventative type. So this is when you have uh, botnets, you have uh, networks that have been hijacked, and then somebody needs to log in or divert um, IP addresses so that they can then regain control over those machines. This is a fairly invasive approach, and it does have collateral damage. That's another word you're going to hear probably today a lot. Collateral damage is the impact to uh, people who aren't at fault, who aren't part of the attack itself, who are bystanders, essentially. By bystanders, bystanders, essentially. So, and thirdly, you have the retaliatory form of attack. So, this is really uh, what you see in the headlines. This is revenge hacking. Um, this is, you know, somebody has hurt me and I'm going to hurt them. And some of the most, uh, well, recent moves have actually sought perhaps to make this more acceptable as well. So I think this is the most contentious type of, of attack that is going to be discussed today. So um, those are really the three. And they're hugely relevant to the conversation that we're going to have. So without further ado, I'll pass it on back to Laurent. Thank you very much. Uh, this is, this is uh, an interesting uh, first step into the area, exploratory, preventative, and retaliatory. That's already a first categorization of, mm -hmm. of uh, this type of um, uh, active measures or uh, hackback uh, activities. Let me turn to Leandro Usiferi, who is a lawyer, policy analyst, and researcher working at the Association for Civil Rights, ADC, in Spanish. Uh, an independent non-for-profit non NGO based in Buenos Aires, Argentina, uh, where he specializes on issues concerning the right to privacy in digital age, 
um, and you will give us, uh, Leandro, uh, um, uh, a civil society and legal and social perspective to this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Laurent. Um, yeah, so basically I, I wanted to, to start by saying that um, it's good to, to start framing this conversation in terms of what we actually mean when we talk about hacking back and uh, proactive cyber defense measures. Uh, so it was great to have Alp's insight on this from the technical perspective because if not, we'll be talking about very different things. So for the purposes of, of my notes and the different comments that I will make, uh, I will address specifically the problem of um, corporations hacking back uh, in that specific sense, as I've mentioned. Um, so basically, to, to start from our concerns from civil society, uh, from a human rights perspective, uh, that we try to, to argue on these issues, um, uh, I would first like to address that the, the simply um, action of hacking back is against what we understand by cybersecurity itself. Um, as the Freedom Online Coalition put in uh, one of their working groups on um, identifying concepts, uh, they, defi they, they defined cybersecurity as uh, the preservation through policy, technology, and education of the availability, confidentiality, and integrity of information and its underlying infrastructure. So it wouldn't be far off to, to agree that the, the very simple concept of hacking back would be against even the core principles uh, that um, uphold uh, cybersecurity itself. Um, it's also worth noting that when we're talking about corporations and human rights, uh, the UN already has guiding principles on this, uh, saying that corporations are also um, dependent on uh, respecting human rights uh, and they should avoid causing or contributing to produce uh, human rights impacts uh, through their own activities and they must seek to prevent or mitigate uh, human rights impacts directly um, that are directly linked to their operations, products or services uh, and different business practices. Uh, so with that said, uh, when we're talking about hacking back, what would be the specific um, human rights impact? Um, on, on one hand, and we're, we're talking about uh, specifically, I'll mention previously, the collateral damage. And most of the impact on, on, on the social perspective comes from that collateral damage. Um, and it, there are different concepts that are linked, and we're going to talk about the attribution problem as well, uh, because all of these different mm -hmm. concepts and, and terminologies are uh, intertwined in a way that allows us to, to put out an argument on how human rights are impacted. Um, so when we're talking about collateral damage and uh, attribution, uh, when, when companies go on hacking back operations and uh, they interfere with uh, other institutions, other corporations, other private individuals' uh, systems, they may be putting uh, other people's right at risk. Um, maybe privacy is a more um, easy one to spot in a way because we would be dealing with, um, I don't know, for example, uh, collecting private data, um, deleting that data, um, but also there are risks to freedom of expression as well. If, for example, the infrastructure or different systems from the, from the target that is hacked back um, is disrupted. Uh, and this happened, uh, there are a few cases uh, that we can later discuss with the panel that, that had happened uh, where uh, a corporation may be hacking back another corporation and the, they would disrupt their systems and different businesses depending on those systems are not allowed to, to function properly. Um, so coming back to the attribution problem, which is basically at, at the core of uh, when we discuss cyber attacks and cybersecurity itself, um, when, when we're uh, analyzing uh, online activities, uh, the nature of those activities don't necessarily um, become obvious uh, when we discover them. Um, so when we're talking about uh, attribution and hacking back, uh, one of the things that needs to come to mind uh, in these discussions is uh, what happens to due process. Uh, we have already legal systems set in place where uh, there's, there needs to be um, a specific procedure to follow in order for the rule of law to, to be complied. 
Uh, so, in, in this regard, uh, when we allow corporations to hack back, uh, in a sense, it, it's worth discussing if we are allowing corporations to act as private judges and uh, private uh, prosecutors, for example. Um, one of the things that uh, is related to attribution is basically understanding uh, what's the purpose of the, of the attack. Uh, so again, as its nature may not be um, uh, obvious at, at first glance, uh, it, it, it's a clear, uh, th there's a clear need to understand if, uh, if, the, if, the, if the hack was to conduct surveillance, to steal information, to, uh, to interfere with a political institution, for example, um, and even more difficult is identifying who the actor behind it is. Um, I would suggest, uh, I would really recommend um, reading Thomas Reed's uh, work on this. Um, he basically uh, classifies attri the, attri the attribution problem in three different layers. Uh, a technical layer, which is basically um, the traceability aspect in terms of uh, identifying an IP address, for example. Uh, the social aspect, which is connecting uh, that technical infrastructure used to a specific uh, person using that technology. And then the political aspect, which is the most important one. Because attributing a cyber attack and attributing a hacking operation is mostly a political act. Um, and that is important in this discussion because um, when we talk about corporations hacking back against other corporations, we need to take into account uh, where those corporate, where, where that other, uh, where the target of that hacking back operation is based, uh, and that companies acting on their own will may be putting diplomatic uh, relationships w from their own base country uh, to the the target country at risk. Um, uh, in terms of um, the, the, the whole debate, I would say that, um, again, having corporations uh, hacking back would be our modern version of uh, a Wild West, in a way, uh, and it's worth also using that kind of analogies in terms, again, of uh, legal procedures that need to be followed and the res um, respect, respecting uh, different legal frameworks. Uh, not only human rights, but also data protection, for example. Um, and just, just to close, um, uh, a simple statement in terms of um, when we're talking about these hacking operations, it's also worth framing it as um, that when companies show this kind of strength in terms of uh, having the, the measures to go after the, the, the targets, um, they are in a way um, uh, inviting challenge, and then challenge incites further conflict. So this is also a problem that needs to be addressed in terms of the escalation of further conflict that might not be um, uh, that that might be um, even worse for again diplomatic tensions and human rights compliance. Thank you very much, Leandro. That, that, so at this point, I'd like to turn to the audience and have a first round of, of questions for these two uh, interventions, and then we'll, we'll continue with the panelists. Are there any questions uh, to, to, to them or, or questions that we could keep also uh, towards the end of the panel for, for uh, all, the, all the panelists? You can use your microphone. It's always the first one which is the most difficult. There you go. Hello, I'm Jin Yeonjo from uh, Korea Internet and Security Agency. Uh, basically, my uh, questions about the, whether uh, hackback is uh, legal actions for private uh, companies. Uh, basically, uh, hackback is uh, one of uh, some actions. Seems to me, it seems to me it is illegal. Hacking is not allowed in new uh, legal systems especially for the uh, foreign uh, targeted attack will be more than just uh, hacking. Basically, there will be some two different uh, sides. Domestically, private uh, hackback is not allowed based on the uh, cybercrime law. Well, in case of uh, uh, targeting a uh, foreign entity, it will be more than uh, complex compared to domestic 
uh, cases, uh, like uh, some involving international law or some diplomatic relations. Uh, well, before going to that issue, uh, do you think a uh, hackback is uh, legally perm permittable or allowable? That is my question. Thank you. Anyone? Uh, well, I think I will address all these issues uh, in my contribution in, I think, 10 minutes. But, uh, ex uh, yes, exactly this is the issues, whether hackback is or not legal under national and international law. And as we will see, uh, there is many uh, aspects of hackbacks that could be uh, a violation of international law and both of national legislation and uh, the, for example, the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, but also under many other obligations for states to not allow their territory to be used against the rights of other states. But we will see a bit further, I think. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll go with our next speaker. Uh, Kaya Siglik, who is with Microsoft, I will let you introduce yourself. Uh, and, um, and so what is your perspective from Microsoft on this issue? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Kaya. I'm a director of cybersecurity policy and the digital diplomacy team at Microsoft. Um, I think I always find it um, interesting because I feel like there's a lot of discussions online and stuff like that around hackback. And whenever I'm on a panel, we're in wide agreement that we all think it's a bad idea. Um, but um, I think uh, some of the challenges there are, uh, to both of your points, I think uh, definitional. Right? I think it means a lot of different things to, a diff to different people. Um, and, um, you know, even, and we talked a little bit about sort of what the different aspects could be, but even the, diff the difference between how you talked about private actors between you two mm -hmm. was like, like, I was like, oh, we don't even know what that means, you know, because you could be corporations to corporations. I think in your remarks, you were like, it's largely private individuals right. and sort of cyber crime. Um, so it's, it's a vast, um, it, it, it is a confused topic, I would say. And when it comes to the industry perspective, I think the industry, there is no one perspective. Right. I, the um, this is when we uh, last year, this year, um, sort of announced the cybersecurity tech accord. It has a line in it that talks about no a commitment to not doing offense, and that was a highly, highly, highly debated uh, topic, a point in the tech accord, partly because everybody has different definitions of it, and sort of the tech accord now has up for consultations a work. Uh, work stream on definitions, but because, you know, like, for us it was, from Microsoft perspective, it was like, yeah, you shouldn't go out and attack. It's just bad for the environment. It uh, further increases uh, the sort of instability in cyberspace. Also, not a lot of people can actually do it accurately. And the worry that we have is if you open it up, it's, you know, people will be like, oh, I think it's this person, to your point about attribution. Um, but would they, do they really know? Do they, do they really have the capability? Um, the second point was um, what, did, what does it actually help, right? Is the, you know, there's one thing, the sort of preventative types of it, of, of hackback and sort of whether they fall under definitions or not. I think that that actually works towards stabilizing and improving cybersecurity. Just retaliation doesn't actually help anything. Makes you, makes you feel better, but you know, does it do anything? Um, and then the other conversation that came up was the, the, I think a lot of security research firms are really concerned just by throwing like the, just a name out there, hackback, that, and trying to ban it, uh, partly because, I, I feel it is banned, but you know, like the, through the conversations, partly because they worry they will close down their uh, ability to do pen testing, because that is an offensive action. If you look at it, you know, it's, a, it's normally, it's allowed, it's in conversation with your client, but you do actually sort of try and intrude into a system. Um, and, simil it's sort of, it's, and similarly sort of actions of security researchers. So I, I would say it's a, it's a confused space, um, but it's, 
and, and, and it is because we kind of talk at cross purposes a lot of times. In reality, I think in, under most national law um, and under, I think, probably international law, it is, uh, and you will talk about it, it is not, it, not something that is legal. I think the, from a Microsoft perspective, we do not encourage it. We do not want to see it expanded at all. Um, I think the, the one thing I probably someone will ask me a question on is, so we do do botnet takedowns, uh, for sort of as, as mentioned, but we don't ever do it ourselves. We do it ourselves, but we do it in cooperation with law enforcement agencies, right? And it's coordinated and there's court orders involved and it's not just us being like, oh, we'll take this down. Um, so I think mm -hmm. that's, I would just sort of, as we have this discussion, keep those points in mind. Thank you very much, Kaya. Now we're getting into the consideration that this is a more complicated space than it looks and that perhaps the concepts we're using mm -hmm. are not that useful, which raises the question of which concept should we use uh, to get the proper conversation on this that would get us somewhere. Um, perhaps, is there any question after this third speaker? Yes, please. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask just uh, to what extent is this a real problem we're trying to solve amongst corporations? Because you've talked about private individuals and, and I was very relieved to, to hear you say actually that it is a very confused space, although we started off with what sounded like quite clear categories or definitions. Actually, I think um, most people find it quite a confusing space and, and quite confusing to define, but it would be helpful to know kind of what is the real problem, if there is one, with corporations undertaking this type of activity. Thank you. Anyone wants to take that? Or we keep it for later. And please. So I can give this one a quick spin. I think we'll dive into this a bit more. But there are really two kinds of, of problem, if we look at it, if we break it down. Mm -hmm. One is uh, the collateral damage um, that I think we've, we've briefly mentioned already, which is really the bystanders, um, but also the types of loss. So you have information loss. If somebody's hacking and releasing information, it's not just the target's money that is lost, um, it's not just the target's resources, but also uh, their customers, their users, people who they track. So there's a very wide potential for collateral damage. And another angle that particularly I think should be a focus in terms of uh, internet governance is the technical uh, impact that these networks aren't designed to carry the kind of traffic. And this is particularly relevant for denial of service type attacks, where you are bringing down every single pathway in between yourself and your target, including your neighbors. So we always see this as, well, I think in, in current discussion, there's a lot of focus on endpoint uh, hacking or endpoint attacks, but we have to remember that denial of service is also a very large, perhaps one of the largest forms of attack. So these are, these are I would say, the two main forms of harm that are real problems that we see. Was your, your point, sorry, was your point more about like how much does it happen? Yeah, um, so, I th so I would say, given that it's illegal in pretty much everywhere, um, I, the, the, the mature corporations, you know, or it's not even mature, but I feel like established corporations, like names that you recognize, don't do it. I think there is an appetite, and there's, that's why you have a discussion, but I, I, I don't think it's sort of at a established level, I don't think it happens very much. I, I would, if I, if I may add just one point, I would think perhaps there is a problem uh, related to uncertainty whether you are in, in the legal or in the illegal. If, if, I, if I follow the, the, the categorization we had uh, from ALP, you know, exploratory, preventative, reta retaliatory, there is an intention there in these three. Uh, you, know, you have an intention to retaliate, intention to prevent, but in your action to prevent, perhaps you are using a technique that will be the same as the one f uh, used for retaliatory. So there is some uncertainty on the part on, of the company uh, facing the attack and trying to, at the end of the day, protect itself. Uh, and that can be part of the complexity of, of the issue. Uh, perhaps we'll go with our next speaker. And, and you, can you hold your question a little bit? We'll go through our next speaker. and. We'll return to the questions, Karine. Uh, Karine, Karine, let me introduce you. You are Associate Professor 
of International Law and Deputy Director of the Cybersecurity Institute at University Grenoble, Grenoble Alpes uh, in France. And you will provide us with a legal perspective on this issue, the international law perspective. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Laurent. First of, first of all, I would like to say that it is impressive to see how many arguments have been raised to use, to praise the virtues of hardback. Hardback could compensate for shortcomings in governmental action. It would have a significant deterrent effect. And last but not least, it will, would be good for business. And it is true that given the dramatic rise of cyber attacks, the cyber security market looks extremely promising for the private sector. And relying on these arguments, some think tanks have advanced the idea that active cyber defense measures by the private sectors should be placed into the corporate toolkit. And it, <coughs> and it is this uh, in mind that a build named ACDC, Active Cyber Defense Certainty Act, has been introduced at the US Congress in 2017 in order to legalize for the first time certain acts of hacking back. However, this initiative contrasts with, for example, the French Paris call for trust and security in the cyberspace released this morning that calls to prevent non-state actors, including the private sector, from hacking back. In a book on cyber attack we have published last year with Theodor Christakis for the French conference held here at the UNESCO on cybersecurity and the role of public and private actors, we have shown that this strong opposition to hackback is due to the risk posed by what we call the wide hackback, that is to say, a hackback that is left to the entire discretion of private actors. Also, as we have also explained, this wild hardback must be distinguished from what we have called a wise cyber defense based on a cooperation between public and private actors and under the control of the states. So I would then uh, briefly address two main issues. First, what are the risk and legal problems of wild hardback? And second, to what extent could a wise cyber defense be more acceptable? As we know, hackback involves various risks for the security of the cyber, uh, cyberspace, risk for the authority of the states, risk of an elitist cyber defense left into the end of the most powerful companies, risk of misattribution, risk of significant collateral damages, and all these risks together could lead to an uncontrolled escalation of violence in the cyberspace. Let's just one minute imagine what could happen if today, or if now, the 200 million of enterprises around the world are authorized to launch cross-border attack in the name of hackback. This is a receipt for cow. This wild hackback also raised many legal problems. What's hacking? <laughs> Someone doesn't like what you're saying about it. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't like it. First of all, I, I would like, so I, I will continue, or I will try to continue. <laughs> First of all, I think that from an international perspective, we have to say that uh, international law does not allow the private sector to conduct hardback. But it is also true that international law does not prohibit hackback as such. However, hackback uh, could uh, violate many different legal rules. For example, under international law, the responsibility of a state could be triggered for the breach of its obligation of due diligence if it has not taken the necessary measures in order to prevent the harmful cross-border hardback launched by a private company from its territory or its ICT. A private company who conducts hardback with transnational consequences could also violate the domestic law of several states. 
First, the state where hardback causes damages, but also second, state from which it acts. Indeed, under the impulse of the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, numerous states have enacted legislation in order to criminalize attacks against data or computer systems. Corporate who launch hardback could then face criminal prosecution in several countries. In this context, it is such necessary to consider to what extent could a wide cyber defense be more acceptable? Can state relies on the private sector? The answer to this question, I think, is yes. As we have explained in our book, that cooperation mechanism between state and the private sector is well known in many legal systems. We have then suggested a scenario where a state could authorize a limited number of certified companies to act under its close control. Such a legal framework could address the concern of the victim and at the same time, it will avoid a large number of risks associated with white hardback. But now, if we want to achieve such a cooperative public-private partnership, we need to be extremely cautious and acting step by step so as not to open or reopen the Pandora box. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Karine. I, I think uh, th this is extremely interesting and another perspective to the issue. If, if so many private sector uh, stakeholders have the possibility to act back, if it becomes legal, then how does it scale? We end up with a problem at the scale of, uh, of the internet as a whole. Um, and I, and I, I note, I underline the, the notion of public-private cooperation here in, in a very, very specific and tailored context. Is there any question? And, and then we'll turn to our last panelist. Yes, please. Um, you're talking a lot about uh, companies hacking each other. But uh, if a hacker uh, would uh, hijack your server or whatever, uh, would you see that as hacking back your own server or just restoring your own infrastructure? So I, I think that, you know, and, and, and I would encourage everybody to introduce themselves. But um, I think I think it's a I think it's it's an attack on you. So you defend yourself. I, but they, with, from our perspective, we would if we were go to go out and sort of take action, we would always do it together with law enforcement. We wouldn't do it by our bar ourselves. I don't know sure if that answers the question, but I think um, you know I, I we would not consider that we have the authority to do something like that. D did you mean like? If, if someone hacks my server, which is hacked already by someone else, should I consider that as an aggression or uh, actually a, some positive action towards me? Yeah, it was more like uh, if it's illegal to hack, is it also illegal to hack your own server back if it's being hijacked or anything? Because it's your own infrastructure. You're trying to protect your own data, your own infrastructure. And if somebody is just taking that away from you, you're... Uh, yeah, to restore your system, you're trying to get it back, of course. Sorry, is hacking your own system hack back? I feel no, but I also think you wouldn't necessarily have to hack it, right, to get it back. Um, I would hope so. <laughs> that would be disturbing. <laughs> so one perspective where that's possibly more relevant is with IoT devices. So you've deployed it to the clients. And then the client doesn't really administer their own system. So is the de while the device is de facto owned by the customer, the device is practically uh, perhaps almost, well, the property or is ma maintained by the company. In that case, uh, there is an expectation for companies to mitigate the harm done by their own machines if these devices have been compromised. And I think this can have an additional uh, aspect to it if the company has gone bust, for example, who will then switch off these, uh, these fridges from say 10 years ago, which are now causing massive uh, denial of service attacks across the world. So that's really an unsolved question. And it does also ask the question, should there be a master key? Uh, so when a company goes bust, for example, somebody can go in and fix the mess afterwards. And these remain, I think, un unsolved problems. Every 
every single step in this, on this issue is more complicated than it looks, actually. It's unclear who really owns or has the capacity to intervene on, on these complex systems. There are maybe uh, chains of actors involved and complex, con contractual complexity among the various stakeholders to maintain a system. Perhaps we'll switch to our last uh, panelist, Yves Verhoeven, is Director for Strategy at NC, the French National Cyber Defense Authority, and he will provide us with the perspective of a government agency on this issue. Thank you very much. So I will start by elaborating a bit on the hardest form of hackback, uh, meaning conducting cyber attacks in response to cyber attacks, and then I, I will take uh, a slightly broader perspective. So if you look at what has happened in the past years, uh, it is true to say that despite the, the mobilization of states to, to fight uh, cybercrime, it is true to say that the efficiency of public policies to discourage um, cyber attackers has been limited. So we can understand that it, it has been tempting for a certain number of persons to promote uh, hack back as cyber attacks to, to answer cyber attacks as a way ahead. However, uh, from the very beginning, I will, I will say that from our perspective, we believe that it would only add chaos to chaos for a certain number of reasons, which have already uh, been, been touched upon uh, earlier. But I will come back to it. We believe that if you try to answer to uh, as a private sector to cyber attacks for yourself or for the benefit of another non-state actor, then there is a high risk of aggravating the situation because of the various possible ways to have misperception. Mm -hmm. The first one is the fact that the victim who wants to answer may in fact target uh, an, in an innocent third party. When you look at the issue of the identification of originators of cyber attacks, it is definitely a challenge that even states struggle to address even though they have access to intelligence. The second point I, I would like to, to touch upon is the fact that hackback operations could easily have disproportionate and unwanted consequences and side effects. If you think about conducting a cyber attack as a surgical strike, a surgical cyber strike, then in fact it is very difficult to imagine a cyber attack, a cyber attack having some very precise contain consequences. It is also uh, definitely a challenge. And uh, also, since the, vi the various parties would certainly be uh, hosted in different countries, there is also a risk of misperception concerning who are the actors, what are the intents, and it could even trigger an, an escalation between states hosting the various actors. So we believe that all this would very, with a very high level of probability lead to uh, having a systemic risk of instability at the global level. We believe that the multiplication of cyber attacks uh, would definitely uh, uh, be the result of accepting hackback, hard form of hackback uh, as acceptable. And we believe that the legitimate use of violence, because we are talking about violence, so the legitimate use of violence should remain the monopoly uh, of the state. So today, hackback is clearly illegal in French law. It is illegal in many national laws um, conforming uh, to, to the Budapest Convention, and France and many stakeholders believe that it should remain so. And this is why this morning, uh, in the Paris call that was released for trust and security in cyber cyberspace, Rejecting hackback uh, from, uh, from uh, non-state actors is one of the specific measures which is promoted. So this is for the hard form of hackback. And of course, uh, there are many other ways to, to react uh, which could be uh, uh, imagined as not strictly passive. Uh, and, and then the issue is, Okay, so if we exclude cyber attacks as a form of, of answer to cyber attacks, still, uh, can't I do anything? 
which may be a, a bit uh, um, on the border. And in fact, we believe that the debates which have risen from uh, the topic of what is called the gray zone, in particular by uh, Carnegie Endowment, we believe that this is a good debate. Even so, these debates can sometimes stumble over the imprecise concepts, imprecise terms like passive or active cyber defense measures. And we believe that we should go beyond that uh, further and analyze clearly what is definitely illegal, what is definitely legal, and what is perhaps in between. So some measures which may be in some conditions be recognized as legal, but it would not be obvious and it would certainly depend on the way that they would be conducted and perhaps even on who conducts them. So this is um, our view on, uh, on uh, let's say, uh, the gray zone. We believe that we should conduct risk analysis for each kind of measure, for each kind of answer to cyber attacks in order to finally analyze the risk, finally analyze whether or not the conduct of such or such measure uh, is acceptable. Uh, and it should all be based on a risk analysis, the same risk analysis as I conducted on hard form of hackback should also be conducted on each form of less hard form of, uh, of hackback. Uh, and we believe that we should, we should all work all together around the table, work on the framework to put on, on this kind of uh, analysis. And it would certainly uh, make us come to the conclusion that there should be some guidance for a certain number of forms of answer. Um, and there should perhaps be some regulation over some actors who could be allowed to conduct some specific measures, but still not conduct cyber attacks. That's all for me. Thank you. Um, let's uh, have questions from the floor, please. Hi, thank you. Uh, my question, actually I have two of them. Uh, first would be, so I understand that public actors are allowed to do the hackback. Uh, question would be, is it efficient the way it's conducted today? Uh, do they have the proper means to do their job and do they cooperate with uh, private actors? And the second one is, I understand that the legal framework is not really clear, uh, so would it be desirable to develop an international framework? Is it realistically going to happen in the next couple of years? Yeah, I feel I should answer. Um, so when, come to, when it comes to public actors, um, well, it, it is obvious that public actors, a certain number of states, have over the years um, worked upon uh, the issue of uh, uh, conducting uh, cyber attacks for different reasons, uh, which can be, and which in many times, many occasions, legitimate from a public policy uh, point of view. So there is uh, some, some kind of uh, um, experience, some specific means I mentioned, having access to intelligence, for instance, uh, and uh, other specificities to public actors. But definitely public actors should refrain from the use, uh, from the excessive use of cyber attacks, definitely. And this is something which has been debated in the past, even though uh, consensus has not always been reached and the failure of GGE uh, is a mark uh, that uh, this is not an easy issue. Um, concerning the legality of the various actions, uh, what I meant was not that there is uncertainty in the legality. Uh, in each national law, it is often very clear what is clearly legal and what is clearly illegal. However, what I meant is that perhaps there is some space because we lack some legal precedence uh, to elaborate uh, and to, pro to provide uh, some background to a certain number of actors so that if they intend, if they intend to use some measures which are not clearly com completely legal in any circumstances, that perhaps if they intend to, to do them, then uh, they should put that into the proper framework uh, and uh, um, conform to some specific guidance to make sure that they are still on the right line. 
just to add, um, I would say the legal aspects are quite clear. Uh, as Eve mentioned, I would say uh, not only in terms of human rights perspective and the international framework of human rights, but also specific national laws on data protection and cybercrime, as I mentioned, the Budapest Convention and so on, that states may um, implement in their own contexts. I would say in, in those aspects, it's quite clear that hacking back, it's illegal um, in terms of those uh, frameworks. Um, so I have another, so I think I really like your framework actually at the beginning, great, because I think it, when it talks about preventative retaliatory, retaliatory um, in particular, you know, I think that's where we, I think a lot of the conversations now is very focused on reta retaliation. And I think where the gray area is, is that preventative space where, you, you know, like in, in this is sort of like slightly more out there examples, but like the, the, in the discussions, some of some of it's been raised that even patching could be actually offensive because you have you actually they they own the system, right? So do you do we have a right to patch their system, um, or um, the other which I feel is in, on the extreme of the argument? The other the other suggestion that sort of I think people are playing with is the creation of honeypots, like if you create a vulnerability to lure in attackers specifically to catch them, you know, it, well, you don't like, go aggressively, you know, attack a system, but it's still a, an a effectively active defense, right? The, um, so, uh, an, another example that I think people also talk about, but it's again on the extreme, is uh, are sandboxes illegal where you basically close off um, the attackers in a specific space, right? So I think that's where more the gray area are, the, the actual just going after a different system. I think we're all kind of in agreement. It's, it's not legal. Uh, yes, if you want now to, um, uh, to reinforce uh, the banning of hackback, I think that uh, you can act step by step. And first one, you can try to universalize the Budapest Convention, which is really important because it is a clear answer to the prohibition of hackback, I think, because it is a crime under the Budapest Convention. But uh, I think, and I think the Paris call is also a step, an important step, in order you know, to see that the international community is against hackback. But I think that there is all, uh, also many other steps that you can uh, reach. For example, we have to, uh, to work together on the question of the prevention of proliferation of malicious ICT. You, you know, we have a, a black market today, which is uh, increasing concerning toolkit, which uh, allow private company to launch a cyber attacks. And I think this is uh, something we have to, we need to address. Uh, we have still now the, the Vasna agreement, but I think that we need to go forward on this question. So th there is many aspects to, to develop, and both at the, I think, at the legal, but also at the economic level, in order to, to show to the uh, companies that the best defense is defense, is not uh, hard back. The, the only one thing I would also say is, so on the Paris call, I, you know, like you said, the international legal community sort of endorses it as an important step, but I think you'll also see that there is a vast number of private sector actors that endorse, that will endorse it, have endorsed yeah. it. So, so it's, I think, it, it, I think there's, there's wide agreement that, that this is a step in the right direction. Thank you. If I, if I can add a couple uh, thoughts on, uh, to, to what I heard, it seems that everybody agree that hackback is a bad idea and should be illegal, but at, at the same time that this is also uh, conceptually confusing, so we need to clarify it. And we have these uh, three categories, exploratory, preventative, and retaliatory type of measures which can help, but at the same time, I'm wondering, you know, you can, is, are, are these the right categories? In other words, I could do something with the intention of being exploratory, but create damages. So should not be the criteria, perhaps the criteria to, to identify whether we are on the good side or on the bad side, to simplify it. Should it be my intention or should it be the, cons the potential consequences or the consequences? And perhaps here we are touching on the gray zone precisely and, and that would be what we would need to clarify. And, and, and just one last point, it would need to be clarified 
internationally. If one country clarifies it for itself, it's probably not enough. The ecosystem is global. So we end up with a, another uh, internet governance issue, perhaps, uh, to put it very, very broadly, or at least a, a, a collective issue at international level. Any reaction to this? I feel I speak a lot, but I would also say I think the Budapest Convention actually clarifies and it is about intent, um, I think. So I think in a lot of legal frameworks have intent in there as a sort of qualifying structure. <coughs> yeah, if I can uh, add something. I, if you look at the idea of, uh, for example, um, uh, patching a third party network that could be vulnerable and uh, um, participating into an uh, attack infrastructure. If you have no contractual uh, connection to the, to the owner of this infrastructure, you're just not allowed to go and patch this infrastructure. Today, in French law, it is illegal. Uh, and this is not retaliatory. Um, this is rather uh, preventative action. And still, today it is illegal. And I'm not sure that it would be made legal uh, in the close future because it would have many consequences. So uh, having the differentiation between exploratory, preventative, and retaliatory is certainly uh, a good basis uh, for the, to discuss the, 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 the strong, strongest form of hackback. But I believe that at some point, if we want to go even fa uh, farther, uh, further in the debate, uh, then we have to go into some sort of risk analysis, measure by measure. Uh, based on a certain number of risks. So, for instance, the risk of disturbance uh, of networks, the risk of uh, unforeseen side effects, the risk of escalation with the attacker, and the risk of triggering a political escalation between states, and perhaps even other risks than, uh, than these ones. Um, so, I, I think we still have some room to elaborate a lot about the, the classification in order to have some uh, fully rational uh, debate. Thank you. We are reaching the end of this open forum, um, and I'd just like to go through each of you for a very quick yes or no question and a very, very short conclusion. So you, you just do the yes or no. The question is, is there a need for more international work in this area? That's the yes, no question. And immediately, okay, what is your last point? Alp. Well, I would say uh, we've answered that definitely a uh, resounding yes. And uh, I would just note that uh, if we don't make the right decisions, there is a very real risk that um, at some point a digital attack will be responded to with a kinetic response. And that's really the, perhaps the end game of, of what we're looking at here. So we need to combine the regulatory efforts, mm -hmm. the technical capacity, and the human rights angle as well to really get to the answer. And this is really a critical time to keep moving forward on this. Leandro? I would say yes. Um, I think we already made some good progress here uh, with really clear arguments um, for the answers that we were supposed to address with this open forum. Uh, and I'd say that it's good that we are debating here uh, in a multi-stakeholder forum because if not, uh, we would then be leaving this to uh, governments and corporations discussing it by themselves and we would lose that aspect from the technical community, academia and, and civil society which is also uh, important. Thank you, I could not agree more. Uh, so I would Karen. say yes, but I, would, I think also I would be careful because I think that I, wor it's like I sometimes worry that, that there's a lot of discussion which paints it as something that needs to happen, right? So I think it's, it, we should talk about it, we should like generate definitions and come to the right sort of agreement around sort of what the appropriate actions are, but also make sure that that we don't talk about it so much that it becomes like a thing where it's a track where we just, it's just going to happen. <laughs> yes, uh, I would also say yes, but um, I think two, two, two aspects. First, uh, we, we need to be very cautious uh, in order not to open, as I said, the, the Pandora box. So we, we need really to act step by step and uh, in a very concrete way, as uh, Yves shown, uh, and both at uh, the national and at the international level in this uh, question, and both on the legal and the technical issues. 
Yeah, again, uh, I, I will talk about the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace. It calls for a multi-stakeholder approach. It calls for uh, general mobilizations. So my answer is yes. And I understand that the, the document, the actual Paris call, is available on the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs site, and we'll hear more about it this afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for your participation in this open forum. Thanks to the audience for also your participation. It's 9 o'clock, almost exact. It's 10 o'clock, sorry. 10 o'clock sharp. Thank you. Thank you.